Well, why are you concerned with bombs at all? Well, in fact, there's lots of bomb incidents across this country every year. A lot of them you don't realize if they aren't dramatic. You don't read about them outside of the local press. Of course, the big incidents like Marah and, and September 11th, you, you read about everywhere. But there are a lot of bomb incidents already across this country. And bombs are the criminal and terrorist wave of the future. We're, going to, we're just going to see more of them. That's pretty much a given. Everybody knows that. What makes them insidious is that they are very easy, very cheap to build. They're not high tech, they're not expensive. You can get the plans uh, with a computer, just download them off the net. They're all over the net. Bombs have a very high impact. I mean, they, they scare people, they, they cause a lot of damage, and they are very effective from their perpetrator's point of view. They're easy to deliver. They can be easily disguised, be easily put in a duffel bag, very simple to deliver. You don't need a large group of people to do this. An isolated individual can do this. A small group can make a very large bomb. Once the bomb goes off, it's difficult to identify the perpetrator and the facilitators that help the perpetrator do this. Unless they claim credit, it can be oftentimes impossible to actually pin it on somebody or some group. And, of course, the forensic examination is difficult because a lot of the evidence is just blown up. As we mentioned, bombs can be easily disguised. They can really be put into anything. I mean, a briefcase, backpack, those are the kinds of things we think about all the time. But they can be secreted in things that we think the volume was already full with something. Like they can be secreted into a computer. You would normally think there's no space in the computer to hide a bomb, but there's plenty. Um, you can put them in shoes, as, as we know from the Richard Reed incident. You can put them really in anything. Even a cell phone can hold enough explosive material to do a lot of damage and kill people. As we mentioned, there are a lot of bombing incidents that happen in this country already anyway. In, in, for instance, in the 20-year period from 1983 to 2002, there were 36,000 bomb incidents in the United States. Almost 6,000 people were injured and 700 people died as a result of those bomb incidents. If you ask your average person on the street, your average cop, your average firefighter, you know, are bombs a serious problem in this country? If one hadn't gone off in their jurisdiction, they'd probably say no, but the statistics indicate otherwise. The FBI will tell you that there are two to 3,000 criminal bombings a year. So it is a serious problem. It is something we need to understand and know how to respond to and have protocols and policies for. Most states, you probably already know this, but most states have some kind of terrorist group active in them already, either domestic or foreign. So the chances of you seeing a bombing in your career is pretty good. Bombs and bombings are not just a problem for large cities. I mean, we tend to think of New York City and Chicago and maybe Los Angeles and San Francisco when we think of where the next bombing is going to be. But for all the reasons we just mentioned, because they're cheap and they're easy and it's hard to identify the people and you don't need a large group to do it, and you have a lot of angry, motivated people out there. Bombings happen and will happen, continue to happen, in small towns too. So don't write off this concern about bombings and bombs and suicide bombers just because you work in a small town or a rural community. You're just as likely to have it happen as your colleagues in NYPD or FDNY. If you take a look at the diagram on page 36, you can see that it shows you the various stages of a bombing, all the things that have to come together in order to make that bombing come off. All the way from things like obtaining funding and purchasing materials and identifying the target at the beginning stages to at the end stages, the final preparation, the moving to the location and the final detonation. What we're going to look at next is what various kinds of agencies can do at various stages to prevent the bombing. If you look at the diagram on uh, slide 37, you can see that the activities in, in gray shadow are the activities that are generally done in secret. That is, identifying the target, obtaining funding, recruiting the bombers, and constructing the device. These are usually done behind closed walls. So unless you are in behind those closed walls in, in someone's residence or maybe even a place of business, you aren't going to see them happening. But public safety agencies, police, fire, EMS, we're inside of people's homes and businesses all the time. We'll talk a little bit later about what you want to look for at these stages, these stages that are done in secret, that 
could potentially stop or avert a bombing. On slide 38, you can see the items in yellow highlight are the, are the stages that need to be done more or less in public. These are things like purchasing the components of the bomb, doing your target selection, which usually involves a good deal of recon, and training or rehearsing the event. These stages are done in public, and we talk a little bit later about what to look for and how you may be able, able to avert the bombing by noticing things at these stages. On slide 39, we have circled the two final stages before the detonation, that is the final preparation of the bomb and the moving to the target, moving the bomb to the target. Once the, bomb has, the bombing has gotten to these stages, once they are out the door and on the way to the target, it's very difficult to stop. So the idea is, as public safety professionals, we want to be alert to what we can do in the previous stages, the stages prior to the final prep and moving to the target, to avert the bombing, because that's where the greatest leverage is. That's where we have the greatest chance of making an impact. With regard to the activities done in secret, uh, obtaining funding, identifying and recruiting the perpetrators, and constructing the device. Uh, there's some impact you can have here, but not as much as in the later stage. With regard to obtaining funding, unless you're a federal law enforcement officer or working with a terrorism task force, you're probably not going to have much ability to have an impact or to prevent a potential bombing here. In terms of identifying and recruiting the perpetrators, Stopping a bombing at this stage is pretty much done with targeted undercover work. So unless, again, that's your specific assignment, uh, you aren't going to have much involvement here. However, in constructing the device, this is where you could have an impact. We have a great story about this later on, but when people are constructing the devices, as we say, they are constructing them in their houses or in their place of business for the most part. And you are in there quite a bit. This is why we went through the chemicals that typically make up bombs in a previous section. This is why we went through the components of a bomb and showed you examples. Because when you are in there as a police officer, as a firefighter, as an EMT, doing your job, if you're aware of your surroundings and you're looking at what's going on, you may pick up on, on these things. You may see some of these chemicals. You may see component, components for a bomb. I mean, someone working on a ham radio doesn't look like someone working on a, on a bomb. The, the components are different and the, the whole layout is different and it just registers in your mind differently. So the reason we went through this familiarization about bombs and explosives previously was so at this stage, the constructing the device stage, you can potentially pick up on some of these cues when you're in somebody's house, when you're in somebody's place of business doing the job that you came there to do. Now you may not recognize a particular chemical or a particular component of a bomb but what you may recognize is that something looks out of place. I mean, it's just not normal to have large amounts of chemicals in most garages, for instance, or most living rooms. So once you see something out of place, once that little red light goes on, maybe you dig a little deeper, and some of this training comes back to you and say, that might be a bomb-making component, at which point, of course, you notify law enforcement authority, you notify uh, the, uh, the local bomb squad, and you get them involved. Clearly, the activities that are done in public are where you're going to be able to have the greatest impact because you'll be able to observe them. These are things like gathering intelligence on the targets, training for the event, purchasing materials. You can see these things happening. You can develop, you can develop intelligence networks so you're notified when other people see these things happening. And you may or may not, but you may be able to be in a position, in some cases, to observe outside in, in a public area some components, some aspects of device construction. When your terrorist or your criminal is reconning or gathering intelligence on a target, there's lots of opportunities for you to notice that, to notice things about a place, to notice activities that aren't normal for people to be doing in that area. For instance, if you've got a repeated and prolonged presence of unknown individuals around an area that's a potential target. I mean, I mean things that are potential targets are obviously uh, public buildings, government buildings, schools, water supplies, you know, anything, bridges, anything that would be worth blowing up. You just may notice suspicious individuals in an area. If you notice suspicious individuals, you should automatically be looking a little more closely at them to see what they're doing, because they're suspicious. 
unusual picture taking, video recording, that kind of stuff. We all know these days that people doing that around public areas, uh, I mean, that's not a tourist attraction, is probably an indicator that we ought to pay a little bit of attention to them, maybe even ask them what they're doing. If you have an unusual use of binoculars, if you've got someone with binox looking in an area where you know there's really nothing to look at all that much, uh, that should set your alarms off. Obviously, people asking questions about security procedures or school hours or this kind of thing, that should be a little red light going off in your head. And you want to work with the facilities, the likely facilities in your jurisdiction to alert them to this. You know, you, the, your school officials should know that if you've got strangers asking questions about school hours and vacations and that kind of stuff, that it could be anybody, it could be innocent, but that's not normal to make a note of it, to get their names, and to report it. Other indicators of recon or intel gathering would be people asking uh, for public documents. I mean, an extensive amount. They want blueprints of, of public buildings. I mean, that's not a normal request. If, unless you're a contractor, you're going to do some work on it. They want schedules and, and, and routes and times and, and things like that. So alert your public servants to be on the lookout for things like that and not to just automatically grant everybody's request without at least wondering if it's a little suspicious. If people are present in a clearly restricted area, that's a big alarm going off. Testing of security measures, this happens a lot when, um, when criminals or terrorists are doing dry runs on a target. They'll deliberately violate a security procedure. I mean, they'll, they'll walk through a restricted area. They'll take a car into an area it's not supposed to be, something like that, to see what the security response is. I mean, they won't have a bomb with them at that time, um, but they want to see what the response is, how competent it is, and how long it takes you to do it. Clearly, the theft or loss of official uniforms is something that you ought to get you wondering. If you have fire uniforms or EMT shirts or police uniforms or even UPS or FedEx uniforms that have been stolen or, or reported lost, that should set off some alarm bells too. That's, that's not normal and we do know that that is a route uh, that is masquerading as official, uh, as official people. That is a route that terrorists and criminals want to take and have taken in the past. People doing map sketching or uh, maybe drawing surrounding areas, if, if they don't look like an artist or they don't look like an architecture student, um, you know, it's, it's probably worth questioning them and at least taking note that it happened and reporting it. Included in this program in a separate document, a separate file, is something called the terrorist indicators. And in that document is an extensive list of these kind of recon and intel indicators and we suggest you open up that file and take a look at it. Now, you may be saying to yourself, well, gosh, I'm not a police officer. I'm an EMT. I'm a firefighter. Um, I'm, I'm in emergency management. I don't have the authority to detain people or ask them questions. Well, that's not quite true. Anybody can go up to anybody in America and initiate a conversation. You can simply see someone doing something that looks suspicious and say, hey, how you doing? What are you doing? Who are you? And, I mean, you can't physically detain them. At that point, you've affected an arrest. And, and unless you're a police officer with probable cause, you can't do that. But anybody can talk to anybody. Anybody can start a conversation. So don't be afraid to. We're all public safety professionals. You want to take the job seriously, and when you see something suspicious, ask about it. Recon and intel gathering aren't the only things that are done in public. They aren't the only things you might observe. You might observe people actually training for the incident. Clearly unusual or suspicious people around an area acting in a suspicious way always warrants investigation. Always warrants going up to them and saying, who are you? What are you doing? I mean, even if they blow you off, even if they're, you know, whatever, at least you've asked and now you have something to report because most people will respond to you. If, you, up to, if you're just doing innocent things in that area, you will probably respond to someone asking you. If you see cho the choreographed movement of individuals or vehicles through an area, well, that's a clue. That's, that's unusual and that should set off an alarm in your head that says something's going on here. Maybe somebody's training for some kind of event. Same thing. Um, with timed movements. If you see people with stopwatches or ti clearly timing a vehicle or timing someone moving from point A to point B, that's another clue. Something suspicious is going on. Bombs, in many instances, bombs are only one component of an attack. In many cases, bombs will be combined with gunfire or some kind of other assault. So if you see some kind of obvious martial or combat occurring uh, in secret, then this is probably something you want to take some notice of. I mean, you know, I'm not talking about martial arts schools, we're not talking about people on the gun range, we're talking about clearly martial warfare type activities, terrorist type activities occurring in secret. 
That's not normal. When someone or some group of people purchases materials for a bomb, this is a public activity. And this is something you can actually get some insight into. Now, many explosive materials these days and their precursors are at least somewhat restricted. I mean, for instance, ANFO, large quantities of ANFO sales are now reportable and somewhat restricted uh, after uh, the Timothy McVeigh incident. So what you want to do is try to monitor the sales in your jurisdiction. This might come under the fire department heading or the police department heading, depending on your jurisdiction. But for these semi-restricted or reportable type explosives or explosive precursors, make it a point to monitor what's being sold and where. Make friends with the vendors who sell these things in your area and get them to tell you, to report you, to pick up the phone and tell you when someone unusual purchases it or when someone purchases an unusually large amount. On the other hand, many bomb components, components and their precursors are not regulated. They're just widely available. You know, a threaded pipe and end caps are, you can pick up in any hardware store. But you should have, you should develop a relationship with the hardware vendors in your, your jurisdiction or your beat and, and ask them, hey, say, if somebody comes in here and they buy 10 6-inch um, threaded pipes and 20 end caps, that's not really normal. I mean, unless, unless, unless you're a construction uh, person doing a very specific job, that's not a real normal purchase for most people. That should be something that you would want them to pick up the phone and call you. And hopefully they got the license plate number of the person that bought that. It may be a completely innocent home project for somebody, but that's the kind of thing that should at least raise an alarm. Point here is there are vendors and suppliers of both restricted and non-restricted bomb-making components in your area or your beat or within the uh, area that your station house serves, whatever. Make it a point to get out to them, make friends with them, and ask them to report to you suspicious activity. We've been saying here that you should take note of these activities and, and, and report them. What does that mean exactly? Well, both you and the people you recruit, such as the vendors and suppliers in your area, can do things like take registration numbers of vehicles of people that they feel are suspicious. You can take your own picture of suspicious people. A lot of people just have digital cameras with them anyway, and we all do in our cell phones. So if there's something suspicious going on, suspicious people, nothing preventing you from taking out your cell phone and taking a picture. That's, that's, that's perfectly legal. You can, as I, we said before, you can ask for names. I mean, you, you can, anyone can start a conversation with anybody. If people present identification to you, if you have the capability to photocopy it or take a digital picture of it, by all means, go ahead. I mean, if it's a suspicious activity you're investigating and someone presents you with some identification, well, go the next step and snap a picture of it if you have that capability. It might be a forged document and, and someone examining that later on can tell that. You want to report this information to your fusion center. Every state has a fusion center. And they have actually become the focal point for gathering, disseminating, analyzing this kind of information. They are the people that sort the wheat from the chaff. They get a lot of you know, screwy information that comes in there. They get a lot of irrelevant information. It doesn't matter. They're happy to get it all. Because it's their job to find the patterns, to find the little bits of important information from all the stuff that comes in and to connect those dots. Just letting people know that they have been detected, if you see them doing suspicious activity, could easily be enough to deter an attack on that location. Operation Safeguard in New York City is a really good example of a successful outreach and reporting program. Um, we don't need to go into detail in, that, in this presentation about that operation, but just Google it. You'll get some interesting reports about what the police and the public safety agencies in New York City did, and they were very successful in getting lots of good, valuable information to help prevent another terrorist attack there. On slide 47, we're just reiterating a point we've made many times before, which is that public safety people are in people's houses and places of business all the time for all kinds of legitimate reasons, and there they have an opportunity to, one, observe things, observe what's going on, observe what may be out of place, and you have an opportunity, once you're there, to talk to people. I mean, we're invited, the way someone once put it is, we're invited into people's homes all the time, whether you're police or fire, and people don't clean up before we come. You, know, you, you wind up going into their house just as it is. You know, people will often say things to fire and EMS personnel that they wouldn't say to the police. They may identify the fact that they got this chemical burn from such and such a chemical that they've been using, or they wouldn't tell that to the police because they know the chemical is, is kind of suspicious. So just because you're not the police 
doesn't mean you can't ask people questions. And you can do so under the guise of medical necessity or fire safety. Now, there are lots of things that we can notice when we're in someone's home or place of business or, or, or some other place where they are that might tip us off that they're planning a bombing incident or they're making bombs. But in order to see it, we actually have to have the awareness to notice it. Now, when police go into a situation, when they go into somebody's home, and they, when they respond to a call, they are generally looking all around most of the time. And they're doing this for two reasons. One is they're looking for danger, because typically when police go into a situation, they're keenly aware of the fact that it might be dangerous. So they're looking for bad guys. They're looking for other dangers. They're also looking for uh, contraband or evidence of a crime, because anything they see in plain sight is, is seasonable, it's seizable and actionable. So police are always looking around if they're doing their job. Fire and EMS can do this too. When you respond to that oven fire in somebody's apartment, once you get through the door, don't necessarily just zero in on that fire. If you're an EMT or paramedic and responding to a report of somebody down, you get through that door, you see the person down, the victim down, don't just zero in on them. Take a second, literally a second or two, and just look around and then head in. And as you're looking around, notice as much as you can. You're looking for the same thing that police are, the same things that police are. You're looking for other dangers. Remember, just because you're a fireman or firefighter, just because you're an EMT or paramedic, doesn't mean that there aren't people there at that scene that might want to hurt you. So look around and assess the danger. Look for people that might be dangerous. Look for animals that might be dangerous. And while you're doing that, look for anything else you might see that might be useful, like evidence of a crime bombs being made, or a bombing incident being planned. The kinds of things you can notice with a very quick scan, by keeping your awareness up, are unusual or out-of-place amounts of a fuel or oxidizer. This is why we went through the whole uh, little mini chemistry lesson that we went through earlier. You might notice some bomb construction activity or explosive materials or precursors. If you see things like blasting caps or dead cord in somebody's apartment, clearly that's not right. That's something that needs to be reported. You might see evidence of bomb plans. You might see maps or schematics or, or routes or something that just doesn't look right for the context uh, of the people in that apartment. You know, most people don't have blueprints of public buildings hanging around their living room, for instance. You might see switches or small uh, electronic parts that might ring a bell and say, that might look like something that could be, make a bomb. They say, you know, as we said earlier, someone fixing a ham radio or, or working on a stereo um, isn't going to have the same kind of components in the same kind of general array that someone making a bomb will. So hopefully that will, will, uh, will trip uh, something in your head and, and cause you to notice that and report it. And remember that switches are kind of interesting in that it doesn't have to be a little toggle switch. It doesn't have to be the kind of thing you buy at a hardware store. Switches can be made from anything. It can be made from mechanical clocks, pieces of aluminum foil, clothespins, Anything that can cause two electrical conducting materials to make contact can make a switch for a bomb, and, and they have in the past. So when you see things that look a little bit out of a place, ask yourself, could that potentially be a switch? I mean, if you see some aluminum foil with some clothespins and some glue, you know, all together on a table, that's not normal. You know, there aren't too many uses for that kind of thing. So hopefully the purpose of this program is to help you recognize that that's out of place that's something you ought to tell somebody about. If you're attending to an injured person and you have any suspicions at all that it might have been an explosion that injured them, ask them about it. Say, what kind of explosive were you working with when this happened? And they may, may be reluctant to tell you, especially if they're up to criminal activity, but if you're there in a medical capacity, they're probably going to be more willing to talk to you than they would be to an investigating police officer. You can say things like, it's very important for us to know what kind of explosive this was, what kind of chemicals you were working with, so that we can treat you correctly and prevent you from getting further hurt. That may cause them to, give, to volunteer a little more information than they would otherwise. But if you suspect that an explosion has caused some kind of injury when, you, when you're working on somebody, by all means, dig in. Dig as, dig as deep and as long as you can to get as much information as you can, because the information you gather on that person for that incident may be all the information that's available to investigators later on. So keep asking questions. On slide 50 we have a really neat story for you that happened in 2003 in Jersey City. 
And in this case, the fire department was dispatched to an apartment for reports of a smoke, uh, reports of smoke. And at arrival, they couldn't find any smoke, but when they were searching, you know, looking for, for um, fires in the apartment, they, uh, they discovered multiple one-gallon milk jugs full of urine. Now, that rang some bells. I mean, that's not normal. And uh, naturally, they were puzzled. A member of that team was a recent graduate of one of the courses we told you about down at New Mexico Tech. And he recognized the fact that, you, that urine is a precursor to a urea nitrate bomb. Actually, what happens is you save your urine, you boil it down to a 30 to 1 concentration, and you use that instead of urea when you make your bomb. Um, this is a technique that's used by a lot of different kinds of terrorists. Now, further search, I mean, obviously they notified the police, etc., and further search of the apartment discovered blueprints and diagrams and notes for the tunnels and bridges that access Manhattan. So clearly, this is a great case, a great example of a firefighter being alert to what was around him and understanding the significance of it, and a bombing attack was averted.